Hello, good evening everyone. Um, I just want to thank the guys from Atlas Copco because we can be here in this beautiful place. It's, it's wonderful. So thank you for that. Um, I think we need to start this presentation by revising this slide a little bit. Because as we saw in Paul's talk earlier, C++ can be really fast. So let's modify this a little bit and say compiling C++ is not very fast. And since we're not using make anymore and we are the cool kills, we use ninja instead. So that's why we do that. Um, so who am I? I am Tobias. Uh, I work at a company called Plex, uh, where I lead the team that is working with the build tools, the tool chains, the CI, the testing, all that. Um, I'm also one of the hosts of the CodeSnack podcast that Harald was talking about. If you haven't heard us, look at codesnack.se. Um, we're mainly going to focus today on compile speed in C++ and to know where, why we started to look at this, I think we need to give you a little bit of background on our product. So the Plex Media Server is a server application you can install on your NAS device or your home computer and stuff like that. But it's also a shared C++ core for our mobile apps and our TV apps. So this is a pretty big C++ project that is both a standalone product and also an embeddable asset in our other apps. Um, it's around 600 C++ files, so not the biggest project you've seen, but these are pretty big and complex structures in here. So this is one of the problems you're going to see later. Um, 700 H files, 300 and, and a lot of the H files are not contains a lot of code, <laughs> which is part of the problem with this. Uh, this. This code base is around 15 years old, so this predates all the fancy C++ features we have, and also some of the fancy techniques of actually making C++ faster to compile, um, like having clean codes and nice includes and stuff like that. We didn't do that. <laughs> um, we also build this for a shitload of configurations, so for every release, we build 23 different build configurations split over seven different architectures. So it's Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, iOS, tvOS, and something I forget. Um, 23 different build configurations are, as I said, embeddable, shareable objects, and full-on servers, debug, release, um, different uh, architecture flags for, for different uh, ARM optimizations and stuff like that. So there is a lot of code being crunched every time someone presses that release button. Um, we also have around 80 third-party dependencies that is linking to this. So this is everything you expect. Boost, OpenSSL, um, curl, all the usual suspects that you need, but we have a lot of them, especially since we're building a video transcoder that depends on a lot of third-party libraries that you don't want to re-implement because a lot of smart video encoding people have iterated on these kind of libraries for a long time. Um, about a year ago, we really started to take in compile speed seriously because we were closing to two hours per build and it was becoming pretty untenable for our developers to send something to CI and have to wait two hours to get something back that they could send to QA and iterate on and so on. It also made automated testing a big sore point for us because you did something, the test failed, then you had to wait two, on a, two hours again before you got the next result. So it was becoming really complicated for our developers. Uh, so we really started to look at compile speed. Uh, the caveat we had, <laughs> and this is one of those things where we, uh, for many reasons, and it's not just being stupid and very cheap, but the hardware we had for this was the hardware that we would have to use. So we couldn't just spend a shitload of money on new hardware because of complicated reasons. Um, but we had to do something about this compile speed. Um, so where are we today, a year later? We're down to 36 minutes. So a pretty good improvement, right? 
we can still do better. We still want to get down to maybe around 20, 15 minutes. That would allow us to turn on automatic testing on every pull request and, and stuff like that, where we're not really today. Yep. We're getting to that. That's kind of part of the presentation. The question was if I'm going to tell you what I did, and I'm yeah. What about incremental So incremental builds, the question was how, how long does an incremental build? We don't do incremental builds on the CI, so these are the CI numbers. Um, and those were the ones that we were really targeting. Local development is, of course, also an, uh, a part of that, but I haven't really shown much of those numbers uh, because it depends so much on which hardware the developer has and stuff like that. But Will you talk about why you don't use incremental builds on the CI? Uh, yeah, uh, so the question was, why don't we use incremental builds? Uh, no, I will not. <laughs> I can tell you we're not using incremental builds on the server, and we did try that for a while, but we did end up in too many problematic situations, which, of course, could have been worked around in different ways, but the, the nature of our CI is very distributed, and it was hard to kind of get a shareable space for the object files, um, so that was part of that problem. Um, so the, the things I'm going to show you today, I, I didn't want to, I want to break down the different things we did, but I wanted to break down them in a quantifiable way. So the slides you're going to see and the numbers you're going to see is just a sub-target. So I'm not building the full application because I didn't want to wait that long to see the numbers when I was doing the presentation. So we're building a sub-target with around 80 C++ files. We're doing this on my Threadripper 1950X. Um, we're using just the Clang C++ compiler, and we're using CMake and Ninja, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that first. Um, so why is C++ so slow to compile? Well, there is a lot of reasons. But for one example, if we just take the pre-processed output of one of our C++ files, we end up with a file that is somewhere around 10 megabytes and 263,000 lines of code. And this is just if you take the pre-processed output of a single C++ file. So that's a lot of file to just parse and eat. And if you're doing that 80 times in this case, that's a lot of reading from disk, a lot of crunching in memory and parsing and stuff like that. And then we have the lovely templates feature of C++ that we all love so much. The problem with it is that the compiler has to spend a lot of time instantiating all those different template things you put in your code. Um, so I will break that down a little bit further uh, soon. Then we have linking. If you have a big application, linking can almost be slower than compiling. How many in here have a very slow linking time in their C++ applications? Yeah, there's a couple of you. Um, yeah? So I will break that down as well later on. Um, another thing that makes C++ slow is that the compiler says that if you run it with an optimization flag, it applies a lot of different optimization passes. And that also takes a lot of time. Um, so how can we know which of these variables takes a lot of time for the compiler to do? Well, Clang has this fancy feature uh, oh, I was just going to mention, if you're using GCC or MSVC, a lot of the techniques I'm going to show you are client-specific, but a lot of them are more gener uh, generic for all C++ compilers. Um, so I'm, I'm not forgetting about you. I'm just focusing on what I had. <laughs> um, client has this fancy feature that can output a flame graph for you where you can see where the compiler spends time. This flame graph is very hard to read for you guys in the back, so I actually made it a little bit more digestible. So a compiler is usually spent, split between a front end and a back end. Um, in this case, we saw that it takes around two seconds to parse that 10 megabytes of file. And then we had a little bit of code gen going on, and then we had a lot of instantiations. So that's the front end. The front end generates something that is sent over to the back end. 
And when I did this graph, I had this huge gap <laughs> in my flame graph that was basically unnamed and took two seconds. And I was very confused about that. And I just added it as a mystery here on the top. You see the purple there because I didn't know what was going on there. Turns out I found a bug <laughs> in Clang. <laughs> so <laughs> that was fun. Uh, this is all, everything you see there on the, on the left side is all optimizations. Um, and Clang breaks that down into two different things. One is the full compile unit optimization and the other one is per method optimization. But it reports it wrong sometimes. <laughs> so I actually filed a bug for LLVM right before this meeting, but I didn't have time to upgrade, update my graphs. Um, so this is a good view. Like, so you could say in this case, and this will vary per file. So one of the techniques I'm going to recommend to you is that you actually use the flame graph to find out why a specific file takes very long. And what you could see in our, one of our cases when we were doing this, we saw that we included one H file from boost that took two seconds to parse. Is that necessary? Maybe not in all the different files we had. And we could move that to a precompiled header and stuff like that to reduce the time it takes to just parse files. So the flame graph functionality of Clang is very useful if you're debugging things like this. So if we want to improve our compile times, where do we start? We could do a faster build system. I was talking in the first slide about a build system called Ninja. If you're not using it, uh, or if you can't use it, it's too bad for you. Uh, it's the fastest build system there is right now. Um, it can, especially for a no operation or incremental build, it's blazingly fast. It's developed to be fast because of Chromium. Um, and if you have CMake definitions, you can just use this build system by telling it to generate Ninja files. How much does it help you when you do a full build? When you do a full build, it helps me around a second for the full build. So, but incremental builds is where it is, is really helping. We can use a faster compiler. And I could say to you, just use Clang. And it's not really true. So you have to actually benchmark your own code because different compilers are fast in different ways. And sometimes you can't even change the compiler. But if you have the possibility, I would definitely try out is GCC or Clang fastest on my code base because they are actually quite comparable and it, it's much more up to how your code style looks. For us, Clang is about three times faster than GCC. Why? Not sure. It is. So to start talking about this, we had our eight C++ files in a sub-target. I built that in 44 seconds on my Threadripper with 32 job threads. So churning through a lot of code. And now we're going to break down what we can do to get this number down. So you remember 44 seconds because that is the target to beat. So let's start with the easy stuff. This is, I think, things you either already are doing or you might very easily do without having to change the code itself. Um, so we can start with a linker. Um, so for us, we saw that we were spending a lot of time in the linking process, especially on debug builds. We were spending up to five to 10 seconds on linking. And we thought that for an incremental build locally on your system, you wanted to have something faster, and it was an easy target for us. Um, so for a release build, what we saw is that the default Linux GNU BFD linker is not that much slower. It's like two seconds slower than, than LLD, which is the LLVM Clang linker. So that's, well, two seconds is two seconds, right? But when you do a debug build, we saw completely different numbers. And we're guessing that this is because how the baseline linker is spending its time iterating symbols. So this is the full build. So this includes the compile unit. So what you can see on top there, um, 
LLD is spending about a half a second for linking, and uh, BFD was spending a lot more. So faster linker might be an option for you. On, on Windows, there are other linkers than the built-in link. In Visual Studio, there is Incredible and stuff like that that can also help with the linking. Uh, the good thing about LLD, and the reason why it's so much faster here, is because it's multi-threaded. So it can actually utilize your course to, to link your application faster. Sorry? Uh, yes, I tried, uh, so the question was, have I tried the gold linker? Yes, I've tried the gold linker as well. LLD is still faster, but it's much better than BFD. So it would be in between there somewhere. So how many in here are using pre-compiled headers? Yeah, a bunch of you. So pre-compiled headers, as you know, takes the header and compiles it before we're actually starting compiling the file so you can reuse that all those headers so you can put a bunch of stuff in there that you can. The good thing about this is that it become a lot easier with the latest version of CMake. It's actually a built-in feature in CMake these days, so you can just do target precompile headers and you get that for free on all the major compilers. So how much faster do you think precompiled headers are? Is it a factor, a big factor or a small factor? What do you guys think? Yeah, so with Visual Studio is a, a large factor, and in Clang it's a less factor. That, that is definitely my experience as well. Someone else? No? So these are the numbers. Um, I'm just going to do everything based on LLD from now on. I'm, I'm kind of putting on my, my so we're going down in, in compile time. But we saw that we could get, we Clang could get a, a sizable reduction from using pre-compiled headers. And this is by putting a lot of the boost headers in the pre-compiled headers. Well, there are a lot of pitfalls with precompiled headers. Like, don't put your own headers in the precompiled header because then you can have rebuild of the whole, whole code base when you're iterating locally. Um, some of our developers actually turn the precompiled header off when they're working locally because they, uh, they have their reasons, I guess. Um, but precompiled headers, good step in the first direction, right? We get a good, good sizable reduction here. We can also cache objects. And this is a, also an external thing that you don't have to touch your code to do. So a, one thing, one way to cache objects is with CC cache. And it's very easy to use. You just add it as a compiler launcher to in CMake and you get caching, right? And what CC cache does is that it's pre-processing the files first, making a hash out of that, and looking then in, a, in, in the file system for looking for that hash. If it finds that hash, it just copies the object file in without having to do the actual co code compile. So if you remember that flame graph, you can think of it like all the right side of the graph is basically removed. Uh, how much faster was this? It's slower, but faster. So on a cold cache, it's actually quite a bit slower. I saw uh, a 30% reduction in compile speed on a cold cache. So it was not really something we could use on our local machines unless you were um, doing a lot of small incremental builds. Uh, and what we saw was that a lot of developers just felt like the build was slower with CC cache in a lot of cases. Um, some things that made us actually remove CC cache from our build system was that uh, it was super hard to debug. Sometimes the build just went forever and we couldn't figure out why and it couldn't find the cached objects from the cache and stuff like that. Um, and we had, on the CI, we had a really big problem with cache sharing. So we have 20 different nodes in our CI and we couldn't reliably share the cache, the CC cache cache, between the machines. Uh, there are other options like SCC cache, which Mozilla uses, that uploads the cached objects to uh, Redis or S3 or stuff like that. But it felt, um, it was very 
Firefox centric. So they had a lot of options that was not really suitable for other ones. So CC cache might work for you. We had to remove it. It just slowed our builds down. Um, and it was super hard to debug because the output was basically, I missed the cache. OK, why? No idea. Um, so now we're getting to the stuff that is, can be a little more complicated to implement, but also can give you bigger gains. Um, unity builds. How many in here are using Unity builds for their build system? One. Uh, in CMake 316, this is built in to CMake. Just slap on the CMake Unity build equals on, and you get automatic Unity builds. What is a Unity build? Unity build. A Unity build is where you take a bunch of your source code, include them in a meta file, so you have a Unity one. That CPP that includes all your other CPP files. The theory behind Unity builds is that you just have to parse the files a lot less. You have to instantiate the templates less, and so bigger objects can go faster. The trick about Unity builds, let me see. The trick about Unity builds is to balance them correctly with the number of cores you have in your machine. So, for example, if you're having 80 uh, objects. In your, in your CPLP application, and you have 16 cores, you don't want to create five big Unity builds, five build big um, files, because then you were actually not using the, all of your cores. So you have to balance this, but you also have to have, what I saw for my application, the golden number was about five to six files per Unity file. But this can be tweaked, and you can kind of you have to dial it in a little bit. Um, the Unity builds can be super complicated to get working correctly, because you're taking all your translation units and smashing them into places where they have not been before, <laughs> and they might not li like being in that place, and give you very strange errors about symbols overmatching and and duplicated uh, instances and stuff like that. But if you look at the numbers. The unit builds are big for a compile, compile time reduction. Um, that's almost half by just getting it to work on unit builds. So this was on my application, 80 source files with, I think, uh, uh, a batch size of six. Uh, and I got these numbers. So that's pretty cool, yep. That's a really good question. So the question is, is the work to actually get it working efficiently, or is it to keep it working? And that's a good question, because uh, one of the reasons we are not using Unity builds yet is because our code is not super clean. And every time a developer changes something, he has to try the Unity build on his local machine, because otherwise it will fail on the CI, for example. So, and you probably don't want to use Unity builds locally. Because if you change one CPP file, you will have to recompile six, but smashed into one. So that might not be ideal. So this is a tricky one, right? Unity build can, gives you, can give you a big gain. But it can also be very complicated to get working and complicated to maintain. But it's something that we are looking at to getting more, working more efficiently locally, for example. Now we're getting into stuff that actually changes your code, right? So how many know what a, the pimple thing is? Good. How many are using it? That's good. That's good. So pimple is where you separate your public and your private uh, part of your code base a little bit better. And the good thing about this is that it can give you a really good speed boost in terms of building your code as well as being cleaner code. And the reason why it gives you a quicker build is because you're not including a lot of private stuff in all your CPP files, for example. But this requires, if you have a legacy code base, this might not be an option unless you have a very long time for refactoring or you can do it in smaller steps. If you're writing new code, I think this is good. There is probably people that disagree, 
but we're trying to write new code like this, and we're very hesitant to change the old code <laughs> because it's a big structural change. So as programmers, when we are faced with a big problem like this, rewriting our code base, what do we usually do? We blame our tools. So let's blame the compiler for being slow. Bad compiler, be faster. So now let's try some other things that to make your code faster. Let's actually try to make the compiler faster. So the first thing we can try is to build Clang with link time optimization. What is link time optimization? It's also called code gen something something in, in, in Visual Studio, or it can be called interprocedural optimization. Sorry? No, that's a different thing. This is, so link time optimization is usually when the compiler compiles your translation unit, your CPP file, into a single object, it can only apply its optimizations on that single object. So CPP file, object file, object file optimized, right? The problem with that is that if the, if the compiler could see your whole application, it could probably do even more optimizations inline code that it couldn't see before and stuff like that. So usually um, Unity builds, where we take bigger, bigger compile files and, 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 and make them compile at once, that makes the compiler possible to see your whole code. So that is usually sometimes referred to a poor man's link time optimization. But both GCC, Visual Studio, and Clang has excellent support for link time optimization these days. So let's try to turn it on on Clang itself. You can do this by building Clang with this option to CMake. And um, if someone wonder what the thin is there, that's a Clang specific type of link time optimization, where instead of smashing together the object files and running optimizations uh, in the linker, it actually s stores the uh, LLVM IR into reinvent uh, representation and runs the full code path or the full optimization pass just as it done before and it can also cache each um, part of that in smart ways. Um, so what that means is that it's LTO minus some of the really annoying things about LTO, like having a huge link time. Um, so let's try to enable this option on, on Clang. How many in here, raise your hand, think that this makes a little bit better? How many thinks this makes a huge reduction in compile time? Two guys, three guys. Okay, here are the results. Uh, so with a pre-compiled header and LTO on the compiler, we get a pretty sizable reduction, 10 seconds. <laughs> but with a Unity build and link time, in the compiler. We also see a very fine reduction, but not as big as the Unity build from beginning, right? So depending on where you are. But I think that most people would love to have this option instead of that option. So what I'm saying here is that if you go today and you install Clang from your apt repository or from llvm.org, you're getting a version of Clang that is slower than it could be. So why then doesn't the distributions enable LTO on Clang by default? Because it requires the full Clang toolchain to do this properly. If you want to use thin LTO on Clang itself, you need to use Clang's linker, you need to use Clang's assembler and stuff like that. So it's a little bit complicated. But if you're building it yourself, you can do this fairly easy, I would say, um, and turn it on and get a really nice speed boost without doing much. Just have to rebuild your compiler. Easy. All right, let's make Clang even faster. Let's do PGO. How many know what PGO is? 
Good. Profile guided optimization. Profile guided optimization is when you build your program in an instrumented state. That means that it's possible for it to output profile inf or, uh, uh, method usage information and other stuff like that. It dumps a big profile out of how the application is used when you're using it. And then you can feed that into the compiler and say, hey, if my program is used like this, can you make that a little bit faster for me? And the compiler says, yes, I can. Um, this is definitely not easy to do. <laughs> now we're getting into very annoying territory um, where we have to start by building a version of Clang that is instrumented. So that's the first line there. Um, then we train the compiler. The good thing is that it's very easy to train your compiler. You have a big pile of source code. You have a compiler that is instrumented. Combine. That outputs a file with all profile information for actually building code with your compiler. Um, you have to think closely about what you're going to use this compiler for. Because the trick with profile guided optimization is that it's basically super tuning your program for exactly the data that you used it on the last time you tried it with the profile. So if you have a code base that you're building over and over and over again, like we do on our CIs, we can actually afford doing this, right? Because we can, we won't build many other things with our compiler. We will build this application with our compiler. But if you're looking for a generic, specific compiler that should compile all the source code in the world, this might not be your best option. You have to have a really big data set in that case to make sure that the profile guiding is going to be correct. Um, when you have that profile information, you build the Clang again, but feed it the profile information in with profdata file. And you can compile this with link time optimization for optimal results, because the linker can actually use the profile information as well. And then we go to that big, beautiful place where we have the full application. We can do all the cool optimizations, and we can do it on a holistic level. Uh, with our profile information. How many things this makes a difference in our compile times? It makes quite a bit of difference, actually. So baseline, 44 seconds. With a profile-guided clang and our pre-compiler header, uh, pre header, we get to 28 seconds. And with Unity, we get even more. The cool thing about this is, as you see, I train this on our code base. I train our Clang on our code base. But even using something as simple as a Hello World program actually speeds up your compiler quite a bit. And the usual trick that most developers that wants to have a profile-guided version of Clang, um, they are building Clang with the instrumented Clang, because Clang is a pretty big C++ code base as well. So you can train it on yourself, basically. Right, so the question is, what, what is actually profile-guided optimization doing to the code, right? Uh, that makes it this much faster. So I don't know if you've ever seen those hints you can set to the compiler, if likely, if unlikely. It basically gives a hint to the compiler that this next if statement is going to likely be true or likely be false. That rearranges the assembler code so that let me see. I'm pretty bad at assembler, and Bjorn could probably tell me exactly what's happening here. But uh, I think that what is happening is that it creates one less jump when you have the likely path in the assembler code. So instead of jumping to the, the next scope, it actually just goes straight down, or whatever you, what, what you can say. Yep? Uh, the, the fourth option to this 
to young uh, um, audience is not taken and that group has taken. Exactly, right, yeah. So, Bjorn? It also tries to change the, the code layout so that the lighting part is uh, more in, this, in the same vicinity, so it's likely to be on the same uh, line in the uh, instruction cache. Yeah, exactly. So this, this plays around with the output of the binary so that it fits better within the usage you're using in both cache lines and, and the actual assembly coded outputs. Yes? Well, maybe I'm confused, but you're talking about compile time, not the efficiency of the outputs. No, but we were increasing the efficiency of Clang. So when it says ah. uh, pre-compile header plus PGO, it's a PGO Clang here yeah. that we're talking about. So we're making Clang faster by, you know, profile guiding it. So that's nice. We're done. 52% in in, uh, reduction in compile speed. It's pretty good, right? Um, and as you see, there is basically something for everyone in here. You don't have access to do anything with compiler. You need to build pre-compile headers. You have access to just recompile, but you're too lazy to train your compiler. Just turn on the LTO option. You're hardcore and you really like building your compiler. Use profile guided optimization, right? Um, this um, won me about 16 beers at the last uh, conference we had because all developers wanted to buy me a beer after we received this reduction. Uh, but we can do even better. And now we're getting into theoretical, because I couldn't get it to work on my hardware. <laughs> so, so the numbers are, are, are not here. <laughs> but I can tell you, if you're braver or if you have better hardware than I have, you can actually use two other tools which doing post-link link optimization instead. So the principle is very similar to profile-guided optimization, but instead of doing it on a different binary, because that's exactly what you're doing, right? When you're, you're profiling, you're building a special version of the compiler that can output profile information, then use that profile information to, to build a new compiler. But that binary won't be the same binary. So, for example, if you're using LTO when you're building your final binary, but you're not using it when you're using profile-guided optimization and stuff like that, you, you won't get the full benefit of this, right? Because it relies so much on how the binary looks. So what post-link optimization is doing is taking, we're profiling a binary in its final form. So in this case, we build maybe even our PGO-optimized Clang, we take that Clang, we use the perf tool to count cycles and stuff like that in the CPU. And this is where I tripped up because it turns out that the perf tool can't be used on AMD hardware and that's what I have. Um, that outputs a profile file and now you can feed it to either LLVM Bolt, which is a Facebook project um, that is taking that profile information and rearranging your final binary into doing even smarter things with cache lines and stuff like that. And according to Facebook, they see 26% um, reduction just from doing post-length optimizations uh, on an already heavily optimized binary. So that's pretty good. As I said, I couldn't get it to work. I actually have to find physical hardware with an Intel processor and run bare bones Linux on it. The downside to that is that it's only going to work on Linux because these tools are made for Linux only. So you can't do it on your Windows or your Mac. The other things I showed before works on all platforms. And since no one wants to collaborate, uh, Propeller is Google's project to do the same thing. Uh, these are not mainline then yet. So these are not in the LLVM version that you can find in the LLVM project, but they are both working towards mainlining it. So we'll see who wins. I don't know. 
This could give a big boost as well, but I haven't been able to do this properly yet. There are also some grab bag stuff in here that I've tried a lot of different things to get the, 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 the compile time down. Um, so I've tried a couple of things there where the, the result is very codependent. So the first option you can pass to Clang is visibility hidden. Uh, I was talking to Arvid before the presentation here and he said that this should be the default and no one should ever use the other option. So take that for what you want. What it does is that it hides all the symbols by default. If you worked on Windows, you're probably more used to this than that on Linux. On Windows, all methods in a shared object is by default hidden and you have to manually set an attribute, DLL spec, whatever, DLL extern something, um, to make it visible. On Linux, this is not true, or at least not in GCC Incline. Um, but with this flag, you can make it that way, and then you have to carefully comb through your code to make sure that it works. Afterwards, there is a lot of pitfalls. I went through this exercise. What are the benefits? Well, we shrink the link, linking table in the binary. So our application lost around two megs of just code size because we shrunk the, the linker table. The other thing is that the linker is faster. On my machine with my code base, I saw around a one second reduction with this. Not huge in any case, but you know, good. And this is good hygiene. The cool thing about it was that our application built with visibility hidden started up 150% faster because the dynamic linker doesn't have to chew through your whole linker table. So if you have a big application with a lot of symbols and you're building, especially if you're building a final binary, there is no reason to export all those symbols on Linux. The next uh, flag has a scary name. Experimental new pass manager. Does that sound like something you want to run on your production code? What is the Clang pass manager? The pass manager is what takes all the optimization pass and, and applies it to, your, to the IR. The new pass manager has a couple of nice features. Like, for example, it can take a look at all your optimizations and cache them so that if it has to, some of the optimizations are run many times. So instead of having to reevaluate the, the IR for every time, it can actually cache the result of a, of a pass. So especially if you're doing very heavy op optimization, it can be faster. I saw about a 1% reduction, uh, but I also saw a 2% reduction, uh, sorry, a 12% reduction when I built Clang with the pass manager, with the experimental pass manager. The reason why I felt like this scary named flag was something I wanted to enable on my code base was because Google was writing to, the Google guys was writing to the mailing list, LLEM dev, and said that they have been using this in production for two years and wanted to make it the default. Um, so that feels like a pretty good proof of concept or proof of viability. Um, this CC can distribute compilation, and I think this doesn't, this doesn't apply to us as much because we build 26 different <laughs> configurations, so we don't need to spend all our cores on building one and the same application. But if you have a very big applications and you have a lot of distributed uh, machines, uh, you can actually distribute your build, and what's happening there is that it basically sends the source code to different physical machines or virtualized machines and, and builds the object files and then sends them back for linking. Might, might work for your workflow. Running link time optimization on your own code makes things interesting, at least. Um, I think this is one of those things where it's a free it's free performance for most of your applications. So if you haven't toyed around with uh, link time optimization, it's something that you want to do, probably. Uh, but 
It also changes the dynamic of how long it takes to compile your files. Because if you remember the flame graph from the beginning, left side, front end, right side, back end. What you're basically doing when you're using link time optimization is taking that whole right side and removing it from each individual compile and moving it all to the linker stage. I saw a small reduction, like a couple of percent maybe faster compiles, depending on the, the type of application. It was not really quantifiable, uh, but it, what it basically does is changing, changing where the time is spent. So it spends a lot more time in the, in the linker, yeah. This was the sub-project. We are actually shipping a lot of our configurations with LTO. There are a couple of platforms where we haven't really dared to turn it on yet because we, it requires a lot of testing, of course. But um, we are actually shipping a lot of our code with link time optimization already. Good thing about link time optimization is that the, the dead stripping code part of your linker can actually work on the whole application. So it can actually say, hey, this symbol is actually not used anywhere. So I can remove it. So usually what you see with link time optimization is a lot of reduction in code as well, in the output size. And then what we talked about in the beginning, the flame graphs, minus F time trace, can output a JSON file. Uh, that JSON file you can then feed to Chrome or to a web app that gives you that flame graph I showed you in the beginning. That can really help you debug. There are also tools taking those JSON files and analyzing your whole project and giving you this is the compiler unit that takes the most and the reason is that it's spending four seconds parsing boost headers. Please help. Um, so good tool, only available in Clang 9. So sorry if you're on an earlier version, but Clang 9 has F time trace. So that's uh, what I learned about compile times. Um, and uh, that's the end of my slides. So thank you for listening. Is there any questions? Hope everyone learned something they want to go home and try. Uh, I want to hear about how much time you saved on your project when you tried a couple of things and optimize your compiler. It's, it's good for your health. Uh, thank you very much. If I want to do that, um, I have a lot of things to do. <laughs> no, but uh, that, that is a good question. I think that there is definitely an opening here for, uh, for someone that wants to set up a Travis or something like that job for, for providing better optimized versions of, of Clang, for sure. I think that if you want to see a good, so for example, what companies that have a lot more resources than what we have, like Apple, for example, the version of Clang they ship in Xcode is super heavily profile guided optimized. Like I, the reason I even started to look at the compiler as part of the problem was that when we saw that Clang inside Xcode was much faster than Clang I downloaded from LLVM.org and I started to think, hey, something is, <laughs> something is fishy here, right? Uh, and the reason for that was that they have a, enormous data set that they run their Clang release binaries on. And I think that while you can see definitely a reduction in a Hello World CPP program that feeds the profile data back, I think that if you want to do this properly, you should have a representable set of source code that you want to compile. Uh, because there, even if I saw a reduction on my machine, that doesn't have to be true for you. Harald? So the question is, if I use the F visibility flag, does that not uh, uh, affect third party headers from third party libraries and stuff like that? Yes, it does. So if you're, 
if you're using the F visibility flag, and this is one of the <laughs> pitfalls I was talking about, you have to be very careful that your dependencies are using the same flags as your main application as long as you're using shared objects because then the compiler can do, we had very strange bugs that crashed in very strange places when we were start playing around with visibility flags. What we saw was that if you compile a shared object with the same flags as your main object, it's not a, a deal. It's when you have different flags here that makes it a problem. Or the other thing you can do if you can't control the third party, if you have a static version of the third party library, you can use that because then the visibility, since the object is not linked yet, it's just object files, that linking will happen in your application so then it won't be a problem either. But it's totally correct that if you have third party libraries not compiled with the same flags, you will see strange stuff happen to your code. But we cannot compile the third party library with the same flag because then those have the visibility markers in the code so that they might not exploit the simple solution, right? That's true. That is true. So that, that, that is a problem. That might not be uh, a viable strategy for you to use the visibility flag in that case. Static works, yes. Yeah, so we had, we had a, a couple of different problems with this. One library we just switched to static compile, another library we couldn't switch to static compile, just because of what you're saying here with the licensing issues. We actually wrote, we actually <laughs> did stupid stuff in the preprocessor to, uh, to set um, the visibility in our header and, and then use it as an external symbol and that works. But you have to be very careful with what you're doing here if you're using a, a third party's shared library and you're not sharing the flags. Yep? Uh, at the start of your talk, you mentioned that you have like 70 or 80 dependencies. Mm -hmm. Are they including the time to compile the two hours you mentioned? Good question. Are the third party dependencies included in compile time? No. We, we compiled, that was actually, uh, was it like a half a year ago or a year ago I was here doing another presentation and we talked about our third party dependency system. We're using uh, a binary version of that to get dependencies from, from Conan instead. If I have uh, examples for the optimi the example for the file and the file that have all these uh, simulations Right, right. So if I have made any of those available. So yeah, have I done any examples? No, I have not yet, but I was actually planning on doing that and then I ran out of time because I want to do something else, uh, but uh, I, I will probably uh, at least give you all links and stuff like that. So if you look at my Twitter there, I probably put up a GitHub repo with a couple of things that I think is useful for everyone that wants to try to do something similar to this. More questions? We good? Everyone want to go home? Optimize their compiler? It's Friday tomorrow.